we are in such remarkable times. And uh, personally, uh, it was just under a week ago, uh, this was on Wednesday of last week, that, you know, we usually get a kind of a news ticker on our science. And suddenly, but I, I didn't get any kind of an, uh, a news alert, a friend wrote, oh, you're in an article in Nature. I thought, no, no, that can't be. And, you know, if for those of you who don't know, there's two great magazines slash journals. One's called Nature and one's called Science. And they're considered the top uh, if you're published in those. Uh, it's sort of the top. It, it's where you get the most visibility. So my colleague Dave Deemer has a Nature cover for his invention of the nanopore sequencer, for example. And when you have a nature or science cover, you usually frame it and you put it on your wall. I mean, even if it's virtual, you would still somehow frame the thing. Well, um, so someone sent a link that uh, your work is in nature, congratulations. And I think we had, some, we had ironically submitted an article to nature um, over the summer on our RNA viroids that we've been uh, self-assembling through wet dry cycling and it was rejected and it was rejected at nature com nature communications too and suddenly there's this article and i looked at it and i thought well it's just a news it looked like uh, the bbc article that happened two weeks ago on origin of life being back in darwin's warm little pond uh, darwin was right all along uh, but this was stronger and i looked at it and it was the main feature of the issue. It wasn't just a news story from the Nature Organization. It was the feature for this month. It wasn't on the cover, but it, it's like very, very high level. And what they had done, this, this particular author had um, written a book on, on origin of life and all the people. And I still have, don't have his book. It just came out. But it's an amazing uh, review of all of our colleagues and Dave and my work together, and of all of the 17 citations, five of them are ours. And so that was really good. And I sent this off to Dave. Dave didn't know about it. And he said, oh, this is uh, somebody who got back, got in touch with me in March. And I didn't even know what it was about. And boom, you know, just, just happens. And what it was, was basically when things like that happen at that level, it indicates a paradigm shift in science. So previous examples of what a paradigm shift is, is back in the 60s, there were all these competing schools of thought that said, well, here's mountain building. Here's a model for mountain building. It's an upthrust process, but volcanoes are made by a different process. It was very complicated. There were all these models for what made continents and what made, explaining what why Hawaii was there and why it was different than Iceland. And they were complicated. And this fellow, Alfred Wegener, had proposed 40 years before the continental drift theory. And it was elegant and it was beautiful and it explained everything. It explained that when plates subducted, they melted and then they came up as volcanoes. And that's why you find them along continental margins. And then when plates also subduct, they pile up material and create these anticline, syncline mountain ranges like we have here in California. And it was all explainable by plates moving and that Africa and South America fit together. And he was, he and, and his followers were always sort of shouted out of meetings. They were denied, you know, the whole famous expression, they, they shouted you down then they begrudgingly accepted you. And then it was true all along, you know, when paradigm shifts happen. And this is now happening in our field that we've, with our, collab our collaborators, posed that life had to start in small pools on land to get them concentrated. Darwin was right. They had to cycle because you need an engine to drive complexity in anything, uh, especially in, in, the, in the chemical world to drive make polymers longer and longer and longer. This is wet dry cycling that Dave came up with. And then you need all these mechanisms, you need access of exogenous delivery of materials into these pools 
to, and, and we now know that from space, we're getting amino acids and nucleobases and sugars and everything from asteroidal infall and volcanic ashes. And it, it's like, it just really works chemically. And it's happened, it's been really acknowledged as of last week, it was, they interviewed our competition, the, the folks that came up with the vent hypothesis for the submarine uh, origin of life at a boiling black smoker, white smoker vent in the bottom of the ocean. And it was pretty much sort of, you know, they, they're kind of, uh, it's kind of definitive that the field has shifted over now. And it's not just us, we're, we're sort of central in the article, especially Dave's work, but key labs have switched over to this approach and are doing really good chemistry and getting good results. I wanted to bring up a few other remarkable ones related to that is uh, this mRNA treatment for coronavirus. It's amazing, it's the, the first uh, viral, uh, a way to attack a virus using messenger RNA to go into the cell and turn on, basically operate the ribosome, which is the machine that makes proteins, to make a bunch of proteins that basically defend you against COVID. And it's the first mRNA vaccine. It's just tremendous that it, it got rushed out. It got, this was on the verge of being possible. And it looked like multi-year clinical trials, but uh, the companies back east that were ready to do, they were ready to go. And we now have it. And it's a messenger RNA-based solution. And ironically, it's the same as similar to what we're doing where we're wet dry cycling and we're assembling RNA in small strands. Similar kind of thing. It's the way to unlock nature or to cleave viral, uh, you know, viral strands, you can cleave viral RNA or you can gum it up, or you can trick the ribosome into making things almost like a pseudovirus to gum up the virus's action. And it's 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 kind of like a, a big sporting event, you know, and you're kicking the ball through all the players to the next goalposts. And you have to figure out a way through. And I think for the next 50 or 100 years, human beings are going to be using all these tremendous tools uh, as basically we come under attack uh, by these pandemics, as we have throughout our history. But it seems like we have, uh, for now, we have a, uh, we have a, a head start. Uh, we've made that jump. Uh, and it's just, it probably couldn't have been done 10 years ago in the same way. So that's a, that's remarkable thing number two. And remarkable thing number three was, and if, I don't know if you saw SN8's test flight from SpaceX from Boca Chica, Texas last week. SN8, it means spaceship, uh, starship number eight, or S, serial number eight of starship. It's yes. Elon, Elon Musk's, uh, it, it looks like something from 1930s sci-fi, right? It, it, looks, it looks like a stretched out uh, version of, of those sort of stubby spaceships that had wings and curving tops, but it's for real. And when I first saw it, I thought it was ludicrous. And I thought it was kind of a fantasy. And so did a colleague of ours, Kim, Kim Stanley Robinson, who's written a wonderful sci-fi book series about Mars. He thought it was a fantasy too. But I'm I'm a convert because what I've been I've been studying it a little bit. I know someone who's on the SpaceX board, so I, I meet them now and then, and I talk to them about what are you guys doing with this enormous thing? Is this a a kind of a comical comical joke? And now I finally get it, and it's it's similar to the, the situation of at Boeing at Boeing aircraft in 1966. Uh, I forget who was the designer of this or the, the founder of Boeing, but they were assembling the first 747 in Everett, Washington. And you could always walk on the catwalk above. This is for like a prototype. They're, they're building the, the 747 airframe. And uh, the head of the project, the head of the company at the time brought his competition in from McDonnell Douglas and these other manufacturers and they walked and showed them 
this thing, which was going to be, you know, double decker on the front, an openable uh, front end for cargo, would have up to 450 passengers. It was a monster. It was like something out of some sci-fi novel. And the other company heads turned to this fellow and said, you're going to bankrupt your company. What are you doing to build such a monster as this thing? And it flew in 1969. The test flight was in 69. And it changed aviation. It had a hard start. I mean, it, but it was the darling of uh, the flagship uh, aircraft of, of airlines worldwide. It, it created the concept of the wide body jet uh, where you could get a wide enough body that you had a different sense of flying it all together. You could put a tennis court in there. Uh, and it led to things like the A380 later, which is kind of replacing it along with Boeing 787, 777, but the risk taker uh, in that case. And I think Elon's doing the same thing. Elon uh, got together with some of the best designers and they looked at the previous ways to lower the cost of access to space. And we're not gonna get there on some exotic technology that de defies the laws of physics. We have to do a better job of using what we have, which is basically burning uh, a high volatile uh, rocket fuel and creating thrust. I mean, that's just how we're gonna get to space. So they concentrated on two things, on making the Raptor engine and make it, making it 100% fully in line where even there's a kind of, in rocket engines, there's a kind of an exhaust part that pushes material out to try to cool the stream. And they're even reusing that. So they're getting like at 100% efficiency for what you can do in a rocket engine. This Raptor engine is just fantastic. Then they concentrate on reusability where the, the launch segment can come back down, flop those legs out at the last minute and land itself back on a pad where it came from. So the, the, the initial segments that are, are lifting are reusable. They're just, they just land themselves. The space shuttle did that for its solid rocket boosters, but those ended up you know, going on shoots into the ocean. There was always damage to them. And because it was a government program, it was always more, arguably more costly to fix them than it was to fly them again, landing them in the oceans like that. And so what Elon did, what they figured out was, hey, we need to fly the whole thing back. Why would you, if you took a 747 and did your flight and then at the end, it, you just destroyed it. You just like, well, people can jump out by parachute and we'll crash it every time. You know, we wouldn't have an airline industry. And so what they worked out is to take this 1930s idea of this thicker bodied thing that they can fly to orbit and having it come down, they can't have it come down entirely on its rear end and fire its engines. It's just not gonna work. But if they, you can glide back, you can fly back to where you started. Now the space shuttle does that, right? The space shuttle is the predecessor to this idea, but it, it, it glides back and lands on, on its wheels. This thing, the Starship has front, uh, sort of a front wing structure. It has flight control surfaces. And what we saw last week was it launching on three Raptor engines going up to 20,000 feet and then turning those engines off, starting to fall, switching fuel supply, a fuel source, going to another engine that would turn it around in mid midair and have it then coming this way as an aircraft, as a big stubby aircraft flying itself on its own back toward uh, the Boca Chica test, you know, test stand and then coming, coming back up, turning these engines back on in mid-flight, which is no small feat, and then coming down onto the pad. They didn't have enough pressure on that top tank. They were an under pressure situation. So the, the Raptors didn't have enough thrust to slow it down enough. So it hit hard and it, it blew up. But pretty much everybody's like, well, we don't really care about that because we, it was just tremendous success that they did this thing. And it just, it bodes so well for in this time of crazy politics, crazy making social media where, you know, you kind of think we're going to hell in a hand, hand basket. 
uh, et cetera, et cetera. And like, oh, the, the, the sky is falling. But then when you see stuff like this, you realize the front edge never was in the political sphere. Rarely it's in the political sphere. Rarely it's in the echo chambers. Uh, rarely it's in the, the sort of noisy, it's in these backroom shops where people are creating an mRNA virus, uh, ant antiviral or, or vaccine, building Starship and figuring it out for access to space, you know, at their own nickel. I mean, this is their government contractor. They take their profit rate and they take their same employees and they're doing Starship as their own company project. It's not, you know, it's, it's bootstrapped and it's, it's breathtaking what they've done compared to what the government, traditional government contractors like Lockheed Martin would be able to do in the same time period. It's, it's almost embarrassing to see the Boeings and the Lockheed Martin still in, in the game because they're about to get displaced by this new generation. But there's many other things and we've got the Hayabusa 2 sample return mission that just dropped the, that uh, sample in Australia, which contains all that black grainy pebbly material in their little compartment. And it's part of the surface of an asteroid returned to the earth for the first time. And it's that material that we think was one of the source feedstocks for the start of life itself. So they just nailed it. They nailed that. I was at a meeting right about this time last year in Japan, in Misasa, Japan, or in Totori Prefecture, Japan, with the Hayabusa 2 team. And they showed uh, Hayabusa, uh, you could see its shadow on Ryugu on the asteroid and showing it automate, it's, it dropped these little disco balls, little disco balls in the surface of the asteroid. And then it navigated itself down close to the surface and pulled back on its own. And the audience, we stood up in standing ovation for this achievement of this automated close approach so far 100 million miles from Earth done by this Japanese team. And they were, they were blushing, but they were uh, doing whatever you do in Japanese for feeling very honored because it was an international uh, team, including Steve Squires from uh, the Mars, the first two Mars rovers was there. And they nailed it. They brought the samples back. Uh, the Chinese are bringing a sample back from the moon. It's like, and one last thing I'll, I'll point out for what I think of as, as remarkable. Uh, uh, another friend of mine is, works on the, what's called the Silicon Team. And that's a group at Apple. I think it's I think it's a thousand people. And Apple decided years ago to make their own chips, their own CPU, design it from the ground up. And my friend is on the silicon team and he's in charge of cooling. He's a mechanical engineer. He has a team that's in charge of cooling the chip. And it's called the M1. And it was it was uh, shipped. I, told me it was shipped back to Apple, it was finished uh, last month, and then it's been announced, and it's been included in uh, MacBook Airs. And what you, what, here's what you'll see. For 20 years now, the press has done their comparison of the speed and performance of the MacBook Air versus the like Dell, I forget what it is, the L13 or something, one of the Dell uh, SSD laptops, and they've always been kind of neck and neck. The reason they've been neck and neck is because they're using the same Intel processor, same memory, you know, there's not much you can do, right, to the underlying platform's identical. But now with this new chip, it's pulled ahead. It's like, phew, like this, battery power, performance, rendering, AI. It's like here, overnight, with this new, new chip. And I asked my friend, I said, what's in this magical thing? He said, it's one package. Everything's in there. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, every bus is in there. There's, there's deep learning, neuro, deep neural network co, uh, hardware in there. There's vision processing hardware in there. There's facial recognition modules in there. There's the CPU. There's all these different classifications of memory that we've never seen before. And there's power management like you can't believe. So if the CPU is recognizing our faces in a Zoom call and it's talking to some neural network thing, it'll run those and it'll run that module. 
But as soon as there's no face to recognize it, she powers those down, does power management on that, powers up exquisitely the parts of the silicon that it just needs, just so that it, it, its battery life will just be stupendous. And I thought, wow, and I said, this friend of mine started, uh, I don't know, a silicon company in 1982. He was uh, at Silicon Graphics. Uh, he, he's founded a company in the 90s that Apple bought. And I said, well, how does it feel? He said, it feels like full circle. It feels incredibly satisfying that I've been in this long enough to see a complete circle in the way we do things back to an all-in-one package, but it's so incredibly advanced. Back in the 80s, we never would have dreamed of this capability of this chip. It's just like, for him, it's like, this blows his mind that this exists. You know, in the barn, in the Digi Barn here, I've got two Cray computers. I've got the Cray 1 and the Cray 2 prototype. And effectively, this chip is a million times more powerful in terms of vector processing than those machines from, from the uh, early 80s. And so it's another example of remarkable times we're in because here are these people working quietly. They're not in the culture wars. They're not screaming at people. They're just doing the best work humans have ever done in the medium of microelectronics quietly. And they come out with it and quietly it slips into our lives. This will be in all the phones. It'll be, it'll give Apple a, a stunning advantage. So you can believe that, you know, HTC, Samsung, and what, they're all working. Intel, they're working on their, their version of this. But this quiet work that's done in the background gives us a capability that blows it. For me, it's like, these are the heroes. These are my heroes for, the, for this time. And, and yes, it's very good that you know, we all got together and we are hopefully going to right size our political discourse and leadership you know, against really a, you know, a de degrading period in the last four years. But at the same time, all this other stuff is, is starting to catch up with us. And it's the stuff that's important for the future. It's these kinds of innovations that'll change the world. And I think that that's, uh, I think that the last, the last thing perhaps is uh, the most remarkable thing that occurred in 2020 was that human beings were shown that we can live uh, lives differently and that everybody on this, on this salon can report how it's changed your life, but we can reduce our air travel by 50 to 80%. We can re reduce consumption of certain things. We can reduce commute times. We can uh, change the way we work and way we live. Uh, some of these things have been very constricting. Uh, I had would have been at 12 scientific meetings this, this year. I, I attended virtually that number uh, virtually. Uh, but we can actually, as a species, lower our impact on the planet overnight if we decide to. And it, we demonstrated that. And I think that there were reports in various places of insect populations rebounding in the spring of 2020 because of the less impact on the environment that was immediate starting in March, April in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, I'm not sure of the details of other, other positive, but listening to uh, uh, Alan and Sons radio show today in the, in the commercial break, they go to traffic and you hear this report. Well, uh, you know, 101 South to you know, San Martin is like completely fine, no accidents running at the limit. Highway 17, nothing to report. Highway 1, where it's usually hell time, is like flowing nicely. 280 and blah, blah, blah 92 and blah, blah, no, nothing to report in the South Bay or the, it's like, that's astonishing that uh, you go on to freeways here and uh, you feel safer. Uh, people seem to be more cautious, uh, more respectful. It's almost like if you take the numbers down, if you, if you go over a certain number of people on the highway or a certain number of people in a store or, or at an office, 
there's a frenzying effect. There's just so many of us that we all go into a mode of, of different kinds of competition. And if we drop that volume below a threshold, we find that we kind of relax again. Um, it's like it's the 70s all over again in the Bay Area at this point, in terms of traffic at least. Uh, anyhow, that, that's, a, that's a, for me personally, that's a remarkable uh, thing that's uh, led me to be in a new relationship with Catherine for almost, it'll be a year coming January 4th that we met and having a new puppy and having three more, three cats here and a whole community here, living a different lifestyle than I ever imagined. And I wouldn't be living this lifestyle if things had continued, I would have done 20 trips. Uh, I would be still exhausted. I would be probably approaching my first health crisis. Uh, definitely would have been approaching or gone through a, a stroke or a heart attack or some kind of early onset problem at age 58 uh, if this hadn't happened. So the, that's pretty remarkable when you when you think about it that that perhaps for many of us it it averted some some things that wouldn't have been so good for us. Bruce, what you're describing is interesting because it has to do with how we choose as a species to respond to crisis. And the vaccine is a very interesting illustration of this to me. <clears throat> crises risen to beget innovation. Uh, crises squandered beget disillusion and, de and degradation. And you know the, the, the first fifth of the 21st century, at least for the United States, has been a several volume textbook of how to squander crises, going back to 9-11 and you know, moving on to the political system that we're in. And so the contrast that you're painting with the innovations that have emerged this year, uh, the innovation in response to the crisis of, uh, of, of COVID being, I think, the most uh, significant, uh, gives us a template for thinking about how we want to proceed in rising to the challenges of the coming decade. You've been describing through your climate mitigation work and other uh, areas, um, you know, things are gonna get real serious real fast. And so empowering the pragmatists and empowering the, uh, the people to do the best work quietly uh, will yield the best results. And I think that the challenge for those of us uh, in this call and, you know, in our individual environments is how to model the, the notion of um, roll up the sleeves and innovate as opposed to rend the garments and panic. It's mm. gonna be an interesting set of challenges. We'll watch the statistics. So they'll roll out, in, in some sense, going through phase three clinical trials so quickly, uh, it, it's for good reason that we're doing this. It'll go to healthcare workers, people at risk, and we'll see the efficacy. And for the rest of the population, we'll be able to see uh, on a massive scale worldwide, the efficacy of uh, these vaccines and how long they last, if, if they're permanent or not, and we'll get data. I think we, we really just have to wait for data. And what our personal decisions, um, you know, in, in a way, if, we're, if we can create herd immunity and if it's six months from now we've got really good data that these are effective or that we need to wait for a second round, then we wait for a second round. But as a species, as a civilization, we can kind of make uh, that decision in the kind of, in the calm and uh, sane way that is done in medical science for a diagnosis of a patient or whatnot, not in the echo chamber. So in a sense, to make your own decision, don't listen to sort of echo chamber, um, you know, uh, extreme views on this or uninformed by un people who don't have any training, you know, track, track the literature, track the numbers. Just as when COVID was rising, we saw really good tracking of, of the numbers of cases and it got better and better and cases by area and tracking mutations going through the population mutations of COVID. We're gonna have really, really good and very publicly available data that tracks the efficacy of these of these vaccines and reports on the cases and there'll be literature that's public. So you can really get all that information if you want to become an expert on this or just, just assure yourself.
So I think it's it's to come, and I think everyone has good intentions. So uh, everyone's worked very hard on this, and uh, um, it's the first the first uh, try at a handling a global viral pandemic that we've ever done as a species. It's the, f the first time we've tried it. So I say go go team go. Another remarkable thing, if if you'll allow me, uh, that's emerged. Uh, Daniel Huberman and people like him, the research, researchers over here at the Hill at Stanford and many places, there, it seems as though if you, if you're, I know Juliana goes back to this era and obviously Roy Wood and looking at the other grain people, Mark here, James, uh, of course, Melissa, we all go back to the era where we remember in the 80s when there was a lot of interest, new interest in, in well-being that really came into the culture in the 80s. The supplements business was really born then. Uh, yoga had really come into the culture uh, via Esalen and other places. And uh, people were doing these practices that seemed pretty weird. You know, there, were, there was uh, people laughing about it in the 80s. And it was called the sort of the new age type thing. But I went to a lot of these things. I, I tried them out. And they were kind of half-baked. Uh, and there were a lot of claims being made for X, Y, and Z in the 80s. And there was primal screen therapy. And there was you know, all these different things. People were trying them out. And uh, now they've become super refined. I mean, I'm, you, you've all heard of me describing the luminous practice that I'm in, which is a highly refined practice based on parts work from Dick Schwartz internal family systems and that's blending like neuropsychology with uh, physiology with early childhood development with uh, models of the human psyche all in one experimental container and then trying testing it on each other over and over and over again and for the last four or five years I've been doing a practice of breath work in the mornings, a pranayam type breath work. I learned it uh, with Art of Living when I was in, in Pakistan uh, from uh, this is a fellow named Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. And it always changed my mood. I had no idea, you know, it's like breath work. I would have thought that was woo woo 10, 15, 20 years ago. But now when I do it, like I did this morning, I changed, I know I'm changing my neurochemistry somehow. I'm, I'm completely changing my system. Doing that type of breath, the repeating breaths, they call it breath of fire sometimes. Uh, and then doing mantra singing. I do mantra singing. And I found that if there's a nervous anxiety inside myself, I, I call it a part, just like Dick Schwartz's system. I sing to those parts. And it, in like an illuminous, way it it's those parts get seen and they dissipate um, and it's just this daily practice and listening to some of these Stanford researchers over the hill they're now studying breath work and how it changes your neurochemistry and each they've gotten it down now to just different types distinct styles of breath work do distinct changes into in your brain just in the the physiology or the physiochemistry of it quickly this is not, it's something that people had found through discovery and then practices emerged around it, but it's a real effect. And I think that that is a remarkable thing coming into the culture in the twenties, that all of these great groups have come together saying psychology and theogens, uh, deep meditative practice, breath work, um, types of exercise, you know, Wim Hof or what, whatever it is, uh, energy work, Reiki, all of those things went kind of from being fringy or being heavily cultural based to coming together, attracting a wonderful cadre of, of practitioners that also attracted very intelligent researchers that said, we could, how do we systematize this? How do we study this? And the reports are coming, the results are coming that these are real. And they're sort of, there are optimal ways of doing them and suboptimal ways, and it depends on the person's physiology, et cetera, et cetera. And a human being is a complex system, 
but we have a whole new set of tools coming into our culture that didn't exist 10 years ago, five years ago, and they're all backed by science. They're backed by repeated practice, test and measure. So they're reductionist as well as spiritual technologies in a way, but they have a reductionist core. Pretty fascinating. So I just wanted to interject with that one more remarkable thing for the 20s. Um, and I will just ditto how I've noticed the effect that breath work has had on me as well. Um, and Bruce, if you have the names of those researchers or research, I for one would be curious to know um, the ones at Stanford. Uh, Daniel Huberman of Stanford. Mm -hmm. uh, we're listening to, I mean, certainly we listen to Rebel Wisdom as a, one of the amazing podcasts that's more cultural. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, Jamie Wheel interviews the most amazing people. Uh, Jamie Wheel is just this, he's like a wheel of, spinning wheel of clarity and humor and listenability. And uh, his uh, former partner, Steve Cutler, has come out with a new book, which is worth looking at as well. They wrote Stealing Fire together, which talked about flow states about three years ago. I was part of the, I'm actually in the book, I, it just briefly, but um, it's an amazing book. It was a, it was a groundbreaking book for its time, Stealing Fire. And, and, and there's so much good content out there, just endless, fantastic, direct to you, not ad sponsored in the way we've been used to, not filtered content from people doing direct work uh, in research, new philosophers, um, you know, people for, people for our times. Uh, they're all there, their voices are there. The Achilles heels of the self is you've got a nucleus and you have a process to copy off the, the DNA is unwound by these unwinding mechanisms, exposing the strands of the nucleus that then allow you to build these uh, RNA uh, ticker tapes, like the old fashioned stock ticker tapes that would come out and people would read them, you know, read the stock numbers. And then that ticker tape, that messenger RNA uh, ticker tape transfers out of the nucleus and it finds its way into a general purpose machine called a ribosome. All it does is take that tipper tape and take the instruction to make a protein by pulling in uh, amino acids. They get pulled in, there's a tunnel, the amino acids get linked together based upon the coding of the ticker tape and then this protein comes out the top and boom it breaks off and it goes through a couple of other processes and now it's a protein that's flowing around ready to do a job. And the power and the beauty of the cell is that it has one machine that can do this. And in a sense, the origin of life, this is what Lauren Williams at Georgia Tech tells us. He said, the origin of life, the story of the origin of life is the story of the origin of the ribosome. The way that you translate information in DNA and RNA into proteins which fold and do jobs. Because the cell has a lot of workers. It has hundreds of thousands of different proteins that do different jobs constantly and are coordinating. Some of them are stuck in the membrane, some of them are breaking stuff down, some of them are unwinding things, some of them are, are metabolizing. Proteins are where it's at, but you need to make lots of them over and over and over again. And this is the whole function of biology. And so it's also the Achilles heel of the cell and viruses come in and they literally trick the uh, nucleus to making this RNA that will go out to the ribosome and make copies of the proteins they need to make a new copy of the virus itself. So if you can create a piece of RNA that gets into the cell and it, it sticks to just the RNA that the, the tricky RNA that the virus has concocted and stops it working, you stop the virus. And the beautiful thing about that is if you, if, if, if you have a 20 segment piece of, of, of RNA lock and key, it's never going to occur naturally in your own cell biology. So it's a guaranteed target that you, you're only gonna shut down that one thing in the cell that's doing that one tricky thing at, at the end port of the ribosome. Now, in the case of the vaccine, it's doing something else. It's, it's coming in 
with these RNAs and it's causing the cell to make new proteins that are beneficial to fighting the virus. So it's another very, very direct and very specific thing. And it's magic technology. It's, it's as almost as if, you know, uh, we are doing surgery on cells now where it was a mystery as to why people were short of breath and their heart was pounding in the past until we discovered blockages in arteries. And when we discovered blockages in arteries, we discovered how we could clear those and suddenly people had five, 10 years of new life. But if we had to learn what the heart was and what a blockage was and how the blockages came to be and we had to invent things like stents and all kinds of techniques to extend people's lives and make their lives, reduce their suffering. And we're now able to do that to some extent at the level of individual cells. So yes, there will be you know, gotchas, there will be failures. There will be procedures that don't work or have follow on effects, but it's part of this progress of saying in nature, either through our own bad habits, maybe our diets and whatnot, we, we wreck our machinery early but we get this pass and that medical science can, can re reduce the, the damage that we might do to ourselves or, or heal us from injury, set a bone, all those uh, overcome congenital diseases. Now at the molecular level, at the level of, of the ribosome and the nucleus, we can go in and start doing these surgical operations, which over time are given, gonna give us control over uh, this, these terrible scourges that come through like sickle cell anemia and like all these other scourges that are at, the, at that deep level of the cell. Uh, we're going to be able to do something about them for human beings. So I see it in, in this huge long picture. And in some sense, uh, it, it's really about the whole story. It's about what the world looks like in 2100. So if we don't do this kind of, of work counteracting pandemics, it's going to be a very different world in 2100 than it would be if we uh, took this really seriously as a, as a species and, and took this on. And you're absolutely right about saying that uh, in, in the past, vaccines had to be given to the whole population because if you had, you know, terrible scourges that were, you know, common in the 1930s that crippled people, uh, one of our former presidents, presidents of Roosevelt, had had polio when he was younger. So he was wheelchair bound. Polio was a terrible scourge and that we had to do the job of getting rid of eradicating polio. I don't think we're ever gonna eradicate coronaviruses. I mean, they're the common cold, they're just gonna be here. But when the lethal ones, ones that are more, more have higher morbidity uh, hit us, uh, we have to be really ready for it. Um, it's almost like the work we've been doing in asteroids. You know, we we see asteroids whizzing past the Earth, and the, the last one turned out to not be a an asteroid. It was a, an old body of a rocket. It was an upper stage of a rocket. But Apophis, this uh, aptly named, I think it's it's close approaches in the 2030s, and then it returned for potential impact 2068. Uh, and there's a lot of study of this. As Apophis comes past the Earth, it'll go between the Earth and the Moon, but much closer to the Earth than it will be to the moon. Somebody can look up the data, I think it's 2036. I think there's two close approaches. But anyway, as it comes past, we'll study it and say, how is the albedo? How is, uh, the, what material is blowing off of it? Because that's gonna tell us how the trajectory is going to be in 2068. And if it returns for impact, it will be a major problem. And so it's almost like, this is with the virus, we, we really have to look at these things. We have to try to deal with these things. We have to try every technique we can because one that's coming in the 30s or 40s may be more lethal uh, and really may take our infrastructure out. It may, uh, like I, I always give this example, the, you know, the Spanish flu of, of 1918, 1919, it targeted healthy adults from age 20 to 40. So healthy adults, it wasn't uh, hitting the old and the infirm or children. So by 1921, 22, you found millions of orphans because both the parents had died in, in the flu. And so if, if corona 
you know, COVID-19 had been like the Spanish flu, it would be a horrific situation for us, absolutely horrific. Uh, it, it was a monster. Um, so we, we got a very, very light touch with this thing compared to previous pandemics. Uh, but it woke us up, it woke up our medical system, it woke up our government, our policy responses, our agencies, the public discourse. It, 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 it showed us that we have just the right nervous system in place. We have things like Zoom, that our nervous system that allow to keep keep our work going, keep our children educated, keep our keep progressing through these tools that didn't exist five, 10 years ago. Um, Amazon boxes keep coming. Uh, and the, the, the food supply didn't get interrupted. I mean, that's just amazing that production, they're saying that the uh, net output of production for the US economy is down 5% from February, uh, the month on month production. That's pretty astonishing that in terms of hard goods, or there was some report that came out today and I was like surprised, I mean, really? We're still, you know, so critical processes have kept going. Um, huge lessons learned. My pop culture point of view from uh, an earlier discussion, which is actually still has me quite startled. Um, talking about the starship and its shape. And uh, because that is the shape, as you said, from movies and things like that. But it's really, to me, it's the shape of the Flash Gordon serial uh, uh, spaceship, which was basically that shape with sparklers on the end. And uh, in Buck Rogers spaceship also was very similar. And I, I don't know if they were lifting that stuff from off from each other or not. But when you look at the history of rocketry, I don't think anything ever looked like that. Goddard and Von Braun and all those people's spaceships were very streamlined. And, uh, and I think that that's just what they continue to do. And then I had to actually look this up. But uh, so when did Buck Rogers and uh, uh, Flash Gordon actually start? And they were both in 1934, which to me means that they were being influenced by Zeppelins. And because the Hindenburg didn't crash for another, what, five years? Three, eight? Anyway, at the end of the 30s. So uh, that's just my observation. And that's also the way I always drew rocket ships, big fat. You know, here's, here's a couple of reflections from a space nerd uh, from a long time since, since probably when you were eight, you were looking at all this stuff. We were all studying this. You were probably studying comics, right? And yeah. I, I, was, I was drawing comics when I was about 10. But um, the reason we got these slim, slim line versions is because in the 1950s, their goal was to deliver ballistic warheads. <laughs> So, you know, it's like, okay, we got a ballistic missile and we converted it to a, an atlas to take guys to space. Uh, well, we'll just make the Mercury capsule that dimension. And then of course, Von Braun's mission for Saturn V was, well, we need to launch a stack and it's gonna have the crew compartment and it's gonna have this and this and it'll all fit in a payload shroud of X. And even Skylab, you know, Skylab was a, an upper stage of a Saturn V launched as a complete lab. It was a stunningly amazing uh, thing because in space, in the space station now, it's really small tin cans because those small tin cans had to be lifted by shuttle or by a, a, a traditional rocket by the Russians, and they were small. So we made a tin can Lego-like thing. Skylab was a great big fat module that you could run around. There's pictures, videos you can watch of the guys running on a run, running track. It's a little reminiscent of 2001 A Space Odyssey, mm -hmm. but it was the last great big fat booster that we had. And I was up at Blue Origin in Kent, Washington, you know, about the time I was visiting Aaron, and went down to the factory and by golly, there's fat rockets again. Uh, New Glenn and, uh, oh, New Shepard, but I stood in the New Glenn a payload shroud and it was, God, it was 15 meters across. I mean, it was just a huge space, absolutely huge space. And I think you're absolutely right. We, we, we got stuck 
you know, the old saying that that the uh, the carriage width of railways is because of the carriage width width of you know Roman carts and and war war uh, chariots, and that stayed and stayed and stayed and all the way to railway gauges, highway widths. You know that's it. The stuff gets stuck. It, like the QWERTY keyboard, you know, it's here to stay. Um, the QWERTY keyboard was developed partially because it was on a throw typewriter. Uh, they had to keep people from jamming the throw, the thrown keys. And so they actually put things in such a way that it was actually less convenient to do letter combinations because it was jamming this particular typewriter. And so the QWERTY keyboard was born as not the optimal John Dvorak years ago tried to create a better keyboard that had 25% better performance and the Dvorak keyboard came up, but people are just so used to, we're stuck with it old format. So the, the format breaking that, that, that both Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk are doing is just wonderful to see that. Um, of course, there's aerodynamic considerations of building a big fat thing, uh, but when you're flying it back, it's better to have a fat thing. It creates something called a lifting body. You know, the shuttle was quite a wide thing and had a reasonable presenting surface so that when you hit the atmosphere and you're coming in, you can use the drag of the atmosphere to slow yourself down and it's an, it's an air control surface. So you have to go fat uh, if you're coming in that way. And the interesting thing about Starship is um, it will land itself on the moon. I mean, if they can get this far, it can land itself on the moon. Uh, there's a version that will never come back through the Earth's atmosphere, so it would be built out of different things. It will have a, 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 a lower stage, which is the real heavy lift, which will be a, just a gigantic SpaceX rocket, which will come back and land itself. And then the upper, it'll be massive. It'll be an absolutely enormous thing when it, when it launches. And to see a private company able to pull this thing off, you know, on the back of government contracts. You know, I ran a, a space company for 10 years called Digital Space, and we did modeling simulation and mission design, and we had our me meager 6% profit rate on all our small government contracts. And I barely had enough resource to move to do anything new on our phase one, phase two SBIRs, which are, you know, pretty small. The money in, in, that, in that world, they describe government contracting money as being like cheap pine firewood. You're in your camp, you're, you go and get, you cut down pine, old pine trees and you put them on your campfire. It warms you for a while and then you gotta go and get more firewood because it never produces anything lasting and that's government contracting for most of us. But Elon has managed to, uh, managed to squeeze out uh, you know, the ability to do what he's doing with Starship. And I'm now gung ho for him. I hope he uh, he does it. I still would like. Here's one last little little note. I was in a line with him in uh, 2003. It was I think it was his first space conference. They they had established uh, SpaceX in 2002, and then there was the the one that was always at the LAX Hilton. So we were down there at the big national space conference, and I was in the line for Starbucks, and Elon was ahead of me. And I already knew who he was. Um, and uh, I said to him, have you thought of using the resources on asteroids, the volatiles, to break, create fueling stations and resources? Because I'd been following Gerard O'Neill's work since the late 70s. And he turned around and he was like, he was polite about it. He didn't really make much of a comment. That's the taciturn Elon Musk. And so that's the last encounter I've had with him. We put our Shepard proposal out uh, three, four years ago with the, the fabric balloon enclosure around an asteroid, increase the internal temperature, gases will come off, we take the water vapor, we make fuels, uh, so we can create large fueling stations. We get fuels from the, the environment. We can get metals that way with gas mining, electroforming it's called, and we can turn them into biospheres, living biospheres within the enclosure and light them and create small worlds. And that's in a sense Gaia's reproductive system. And that's all of my 
way out their vision of, of creating a, a, a solar system for humanity. And I think that that's, that's still on the cards because what Elon is relying upon with Starship is they launch and they've got it in orbit and they launch a second Starship, which is just a tanker and it backs up. They mate this way and it, it refuels it so it can go beyond to the moon or Mars or whatnot. But when they get out to Mars, they still got the problem of needing fuel to come back. And I think asteroid sources will be it. But we're not looking, we're looking to the late 30s into the 40s before this is even, a, you know, and is it tourism? Is it, I don't believe settling the surface of Mars is a smart idea. I, I would side with the many experts, who, experts including this, uh, this movie director lately who's sort of taking Elon to task for his Mars settlement ideas that they're just really impractical. Um, I would side with Jeff Bezos's approach, which is to build megastructures in space to expand civilization. That's the Gerard O'Neill approach. Anyway, long-winded answer to Larry's short, short question. My partner here, Catherine Lucas, and she had, she had to take the evening off so she would be uh, on her call, but she'll watch this later. Uh, she has a, a RA, rheumatoid arthritis, and there's, there's many types of RA that I've learned a little bit about it in the last year. Uh, and it's a, she takes prednisone and a biologic, which is hyper activates her immune system. Because what's happening with RA is there's a, it's a autoimmune condition where the system's attacking itself. And I watch, you know, uh, so she never gets sick. She, she never gets a cold or flu because her immune system is so on but I can sort of sense in her, and it probably is true with other people, you know, if you take prednisone, it's, it's really hyperactivating. Um, in order to prevent a flare of RA, you might have to take 15, 20 uh, units, I mean, micro, my micrograms, I think, of prednisone, and it's intense. Um, in the times in the past when I've taken just a small amount of prednisone, oh my God, it's just like hyperactivating. And, it, it does drive your system at a high level uh, and it's not good for it. So you're absolutely, you're absolutely uh, correct, Roy. I mean, there's the downside is this hyperactivation does do, it can do organ damage. It can do all kinds of things. There's a price to be paid for it. Um, she had a, uh, she was in the hospital about two months ago and because her her system was so hyperactivated in hyperdefensive mode, the physicians couldn't figure out what to do for her. And her blood pressure was dropping way down. And she was like, she was at 104 degrees. And they finally worked it out that she, they had to give her more prednisone. And this was counterintuitive, but they did. And it brought her blood pressure back up and her temperature down. So we're just really learning and she could have died. She really, when I dropped her off at the hospital on that uh, Thursday morning, I had no, I couldn't communicate with her. I had no idea if she'd ever be coming home. By Friday morning, she was in this incredibly dangerous situation facing surgery and she came home on Saturday morning. Right. So it's like, it's a crazy roller coaster ride when, when we are activating our immune system like this. And we're, we're just going to have to learn about it, I guess. It, uh, I'm, I'm learning about it in our own family right now. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Bruce, for being here. And I really appreciate um, your question. Um, for me and those who are in uh, aligned in my immediate circle, one of the uh, themes that has been coming up is about being adaptable and flexible. And, um, and also just being really mindful of the immediate moment and what we can do. And I really appreciated at the beginning of your presentation and, and your transmission here this evening is you were uh, discussing, you know, just the, the difference between the noise and then the ones who are in the back room working quietly and, dig and diligently. And what, when, when we have choices, that come up each day as to what we're going to engage in, we can choose, do we wanna be working 
in the back room with whatever our skill set is, with whatever our gifts are and whatever is speaking to us and, and tracking the alignments? Or do we want to be caught up in the noise? And it can be very easy to get caught up in the noise if we're not careful. I, I just, you reminded me that uh, uh, I'd like to, without giving away her, her whole uh, plan, uh, Catherine's kind of identifying, she's, she's a real go-getter. She's going to make this next decade uh, into, she's going to do some world-changing things. She, if you don't know who she is, she's, her name's Catherine Lucas. We're, we're partners, brand new partners are almost a year. And she uh, created a company called Farmhouse Culture, which developed uh, the first fermented live uh, sauerkrauts in the United States that returned it to a, and made it into a national brand and then created a product called Gut Shots, which is sauerkraut juice. And you'll find it everywhere. It's a, a national brand. She's no longer with that company. But what she learned in, in the farmhouse experience of about a decade building a consumer product company uh, was all the foibles that can happen in the old food industry, which uh, she has certainly, she claims and can demonstrate has made us sick, uh, whether it be things like glyphosate, high starch, you know, like the, the high carb economy. I mean, look at the conditions for obesity in this country and just people having autoimmune uh, diseases when they're 15, you know, the 25% of teenagers or something like that being in, in serious health crisis. It's a, it's a catastrophe. In fact, the, the food system and all the combined health effects that are making young people ill is vastly uh, larger in proportion than the effects of COVID-19. I mean, it's a, it's a national emergency uh, that our young people are so unhealthy. Um, and so she's motivated and by all this and has developed some products that are high, uh, high fiber for the gut. Uh, that help rebuild gut linings that have been destroyed by chemicals in the system or just the diets, this, the so-called sad standard American diet. And these things that counteract, which is fermented foods tend to, to counteract these deleterious effects. And I'm not an expert on any of this, but it builds the mi gut microbiome. If the gut microbiome is shot, you're shot. And we had our biome test done over the summer and both of our gut microbiomes are kind of half shot. They're not really that good compared to say somebody living closer to the land in more indigenous communities, they would have a much richer microbiome than we do. Uh, so anyway, so she's taking this time of COVID, the time of 2020, 2021 to come up with a new architecture by which uh, basically the home and hearth of the days of old when people baked for their community. They made food for their local community in their homes from the materials that, that they got from the farmers in their area. It's very, very common. It was a ubiquitous food distribution system. And the fact that we go and we go to a supermarket and buy stuff that's shipped across the world is anomalous. And we're getting the results of all of that. We're not getting a rich local microbiome. We're getting, you know, packaging. We're getting additives. You know, if you look at, she she describes how uh, bread companies and all these companies they start out when, if you look at the list of ingredients, it's small in the initial phases of these natural food companies, and due to the marketing department, she claims is the main effect. The ingredients list grows like this on these package on these uh, products over the years, and then it becomes this the soup of unpredictability. And if we're worried about vaccines being unpredictable, what about our the food we're putting in our bodies? So the way, the way around that is to empower people in a kind of Airbnb of kitchens, kind of like a let people make food locally and uh, supply their neighbors. And when you look at it, you, you can extend that out uh, to just about everything. I mean, we used to take care of our neighbor's children we used to do schooling for our, our in our in our community in our houses. Uh, maybe one person would do all the laundry for the village or something. Maybe this is what's going to return this idea instead of outsourcing all that 
insourcing all that uh, because if people are chronically unemployed, if there's an economy where 25% of the people are off benefits and they're unemployed indefinitely, uh, they can create, they can be entrepreneurs and, but very, very much based in their homes. And because we have apps and we have good, clear communications and we have ways of making payments, purchases, we can do fulfillment, we can do it all. It's easy for a person to potentially get a package that would allow them to start a home-based business uh, that can really refactor huge parts of the economy and not outsource our food, not outsource our children's education, not outsource all these things. Even, you know, clothing, you know, who knows? I mean, maybe there'll be the return of cottage industries around clothing. Uh, and it's a way in California, you can make up to $60,000 uh, with this bill that was passed uh, to allow home-based food production and meals. You can make up to $60,000 a year out of your own kitchen without be, being going through the whole process of a, of a co-packer or a food production company. The regulations are pretty uh, difficult and costly if you're gonna go there. So anyway, that's just, um, that's a kind of remarkable thing for me. I didn't know anything about this before I met Catherine that this, this is a possibility in the 20s of this type of thing happening in neighborhoods around you, uh, not just the rideshare economy or the Airbnb economy, uh, maybe even everything being done locally uh, and it might be healthier for us. So I, I think I'll uh, open it for any last comments. That's my last remarkable remark of the evening, which is uh, remarkable. Has anybody ever met anyone from YAP? And uh, I remember uh, years ago when I was looking at traveling in some crazy place and we thought, what's the craziest place you could go in the world? Yap. So we went to the, the Yap homepage and it literally said, for the month of April, there are no events in Yap. For the month of May, there are no events in Yap in the month of May. And then June was Yap Day. I was like, well, we got to go for Yap Day. And I think Yap is where they have the large stone coins, right? The famous uh, heaviest currency in the world. That's correct, yeah. <laughs> we also uh, I currently don't have the virus. So uh, one of the few places where, where we can still congregate if we want to. And uh, actually it's, it's, it's quite a paradise. Really nice here. Um, Yap days uh, probably will happen again this coming year. Uh, but you know, the borders right now are closed. So it really depends on how effective um, the international processes are with the, the, the vaccine and the virus, um, whether or not the borders will open. Because we, we don't have much by way of, of uh, medical infrastructure. Um, I think we have one ventilator machine for the whole island. Uh, so we're, we're really uh, trying to stay stay uh, isolated for a bit um, but it is beautiful here definitely it's like you're in a space colony that's separated from <laughs> it's it's yeah it is i mean it's a 40 square mile island um so it's pretty small uh there there are eight thousand people here so it's mm -hmm. it, i guess it would be similar to a space colony and and, and my experience, I've been here for a year. Uh, there's certainly certain things I miss, different foods, seeing different <laughs> kinds of animals. And I could see how someone who grew up here would not miss those things. They would say, oh, no, it's fine. It's beautiful. But if you come to a place that, that's an island place, you, you, you sort of get into a different rhythm. Um, I've, I feel like uh, it's definitely a, a beautiful place. I would, I, I'm not sad that I'm here. Um, but you know, you get to miss travel and things like that too. But, um, oh, well, thank you for the report from Yap. I was so excited when you mentioned Viome. I actually just had my battery of tests run last month, and the results were, I mean, like 84 pages of deep learning quantified data. 
but much like yourself, I was really deficient in gut floral activity, activity as well. And I'm starting to learn more about diets that can help to optimize for that and all the value of fermented foods, really interesting stuff. My hand went up when you were asking about questions of 2021, how we can carry lessons learned and opportunities we've been able to leverage forwards into the new year. And I'm especially interested in all the visionary practices that you're describing. For me personally, the opportunity to slow down this year has allowed me to invest more time in meditation. And I've been combining that with binaural technologies for brainwave entrainment at different frequencies as well as meditation, uh, like neurofeedback to facilitate deeper states of meditation. I've been using a brain like machine like electroencephalographic interface. This doesn't have to be a huge question, but I'm really looking forward to hear more from you and your thoughts and your work with those technologies on future calls. Thank you, Aubrey. And in fact, right about now, uh, last year was the TransTech conference, uh, which had been growing and growing and growing and I think topped a thousand people last year and it's called transformative technologies. And it was started just four or five years ago. Uh, at, it was held at Sofia University in Palo Alto here and then moved to a big hotel. And my God, I mean, just the explosion of companies, venture funds, uh, practitioners, uh, some, some of the older practitioners are here in, in the Santa Cruz mountains. We have Heart Math Institute here. Uh, was founded here by Doc Childress, I think about 25 years ago. It was one of the first bio, they would monitor heart rate, breathing, et cetera, et cetera. And so HeartMath is, was one of the core founders of the trans tech movement, but it's all amazing people, young people internationally uh, using all these tools. And I would, I would expect that this industry will grow up and give us so much, uh, so many tools, you know, beyond Fitbit, beyond Apple Watch, beyond these kinds of things. Uh, can you imagine my breathwork sessions are doing chemical changes, but can you imagine that if I had a subcutaneous or I had a chip that would monitor everything about what's going on with my body based upon sleep patterns, breath, whether I'm holding my breath, uh, what it's doing to my blood chemistry, my foods, food, certain foods will depress me and take my system down. Uh, certain foods are terrible for my gut microbiome. They can actually almost make me feel like I'm having a heart attack. Now I just barely know that, but in the future there'll be an implanted technology that is going to give me an exquisite look into my system and allow me to live a life free from the things that I've just gotten used to suffering with you know, when you have a meal of a certain type and you hear a buzzing in your ears and you know there's something wrong, is it early onset diabetes? Is it whatever? We just don't know. These are transient things. But with implants and monitoring systems, we're going to just know all of it. And, and we're going to have, a, as a result, the ability to have vibrant, healthy lives and basically avoid the crashing into the abutments of cancer here or heart disease here or stroke here or you know, glycemic issues here or RA here, we're gonna avoid colliding with those terrible conditions because uh, we'll, have, we'll have the view out the windshield of what is really going on in our engine. We'll be able to pilot our, the car of our bodies and our psyches. And uh, it, I think just we're gonna have all these tools and the legalization of the decriminalization of entheogens has been a, a huge unexpected, you know, from you know, medical marijuana here in California in 1996 to half the states in the union having some uh, availability and some access and all the way to recreational. And now we have Oregon going all the way toward Portugal style decriminalization. Uh, it's stunning that this happens in this kind of crazy political epoch. Uh, phase three clinical trials for MDMA, you know, MAPS is just down the road here. It's gonna help millions of people. Practitioners are gonna help millions of people with MDMA assisted psychotherapy sessions. And that's gonna change society. It's gonna change the United States, uh, that alone. Um, 
these stories of transformation that people will go through because it's not just a medical change or a sort of a psychological, neurological, conditional change. It's a personal spiritual transformation that these people will come through and they will bring the story of that to everyone around them. And people will watch that transformation happen and it will ground society and open our hearts to, you know, it's, and it could be a veteran uh, having PTSD nightmares, or it could be someone who's dealing with PTSD and PTSD is so endemic in our society. And we have a tool now, uh, many tools, but we have this particular tool coming back into, into psychiatry and psychotherapy that was, has been gone since the mid eighties. It's just, it's just extraordinary. That, that all of that has happened under the cloud of this crazy, um, you know, in a sense, a return toward uh, oligarchy worldwide and a breakdown in trust of political institutions, uh, which leads to sort of a strongman type uh, leadership, where, whether it's Hungary or other countries or our country, uh, belief in the strongman type leadership. And maybe that's going to be a tide that will be receding but in, in the middle of all that come these tools. The, one of the greatest, some of the greatest spiritual tools will, that have ever existed in, in human history in that, in that setting. Real briefly, and this is building off of Juliana's point, but it, it also builds off of Karen's point. The next year, I think, is gonna really define the, the course of the decade. We're coming out of a major pattern break. We're coming into a new political dynamic. We're seeing the first, you know, really significant high office holder in the Gen X generation <laughs> coming in. All of these things mean for those of us in this environment, thoughtful people, we have an opportunity in the next six to 16 months to make a big impact, to enforce a new way of being in our own lives. It's take out of the pandemic the lessons of how you want to control your time, you know, uh, guarding the personal health that you've you've created, guarding the way that you use your time, but also in the public sphere, it's all of the things that Bruce has been talking about here, how to bring pragmatic solutions out into the world. And Juliana made great points about that. So, just in 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 very brief summary, you know, we've got a very small window of opportunity to create a new normal. So let's let the thoughtful people define the normal and not the, uh, the frantic people. Absolutely. Um, well, all I want to do is express gratitude um, for Bruce, for this community, for all the wonderful people on this call. Um, happy holidays, take care, stay healthy. And yeah, would love to kind of keep this momentum and echoing what Charles said, um, yeah, let's do this. Let's make this world a better place. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful holiday break. And uh, we're going to really be celebrating. 21 is a lucky number, right? Things, wonderful things, magical things happen when you're 21 years old. So we now know we're in the 21st century. We're not in a leftover of the 20th the frenetic left or we are now in the 21st century. We're in the new millennium, perhaps in the year 2021. <laughs> and uh, sometimes takes takes that uh, that long to leave the old behind.